Okay, we can start. So it's a pleasure to have Hiroshi Oguri from Caltech and the APMU, and he's going to talk about entanglement and geometry. So Thank please. you. Can you hear me? Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, good to have a response. <laughs> so, uh, so it's very, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to give my set of lectures here. I have given many lectures at this uh, spring school and topological string theory and supersymmetric field theory. But this time, the organizer asked me to talk about the entanglement and geometry. And uh, the study of ADS-CFT correspondence in the last uh, uh, several years revealed that uh, the quantum state that described a, a gravitational system seems to have very interesting uh, entanglement properties. And uh, exploiting that, uh, we have gained quite a bit of uh, useful information about quantum gravity in general. And then uh, I would like to review some of these developments in the past few years. Uh, I think I have one hour for my first lecture, which means uh, to, until 12.40 or something like that, right? One hour. Yes, thank you. Great. So, uh, so today, I will basically talk about a very elementary thing about information theory, entropy, mutual information, etc., cetera, so, th so that we know what we are talking about in the rest of the lecture. And then tomorrow, I plan to talk about primer of ADS-CFT and then uh, introduce notion of holographic entanglement entropy. And then we'll go on to talk about the entanglement reconstruction, symmetry in quantum theory of gravity, et cetera. So uh, let me start with the concept of entropy, which I believe uh, you are all familiar with. Uh, in StatMec, we learned that uh, entropy S is given by log of uh, the number of microstate. in the microcanonical ensemble. I'm setting uh, Boltzmann constant k to be equal to 1. On the other hand, uh, in information theory, in the information theory, uh, so suppose, for example, there is an event A uh, that happens with probability P. Can you read uh, my handwriting on this side? OK, good. So suppose that uh, uh, there is some event A that happens with probability P. OK. And then you don't know whether it happens or not. But if you, if you learn that it happens, like for example, at the presidential election last year, we didn't know which one is going to win. And then on the, night, uh, on the day after, we learned, oh, this guy won. And then that's some information, right? So then, then you gain some information. So then there is a way to quantify that information, which is minus log P. So this is a notion of entropy uh, in the information theory. So for example, if P is 1, that if we are, you are sure that it's going to happen, and it happens, you are not gaining any information. So then and, uh, the amount of information is 0. So I hope that this lecture is going to be actually P less than 1, but we'll find out. But on the other hand, uh, if you, the very rare event happens and you are surprised by that event happening, I have had that, such an experience last year, then this is going to be very large, right? Uh, so uh, if each microstate is equally probable, and if the amount of information, so, so in that case, if uh, all the event, the, suppose you have omega events, and if all the event happens uh, uh, with equal probability, p is equal to 1 over omega, in this case, the, this uh, uh, minus log p, is equal to log omega. So these two, uh, two notions coincide. There are uh, various good reasons why we are considering logarithm. The one of the primary reasons is the following. So suppose uh, you have two events, A and B. And suppose these are independent. And, and the, suppose these probabilities are given by P of A and P of B. These are the probabilities that these two events, A and B, happens. And if these two events happen independently, then the joint probability is the product. So if I take log of this, then it's a sum. So what this means is that information is additive that if you learn that both A and B happen simultaneously and they are independent, 
the amount of information you gain is additive. And in fact, uh, you can prove that, uh, that the log is the only function which has this property. So, so this is why we use logarithm. Now, suppose you have n events that are mutually exclusive uh, with probability p1, p2, pn in such a way that uh, they sum up to be 1. OK? So then the, uh, so you can ask, well, we are going to do some experiment to find out which one of these n things happens. But we don't know yet. So the, what is the expected amount of information you gain by doing that? Well, the, uh, the amount of information that you would gain by seeing that event i happen is minus, uh, uh, p, uh, minus log p. So that means that uh, the expectation value would be sum of all of these. So this is, this is denoted with S and is called Shannon entropy. So this is the expected amount of information you gain by doing this experiment and try to find out which one of the n events happens. There are a couple of uh, important uh, uh, properties that this Shannon entropy has. So, uh, so this is going to be exercise for you. Both are very simple and algebraic. The first is to show that S is, of course, non-negative. And the question is uh, when uh, S is going to be 0. So that's the uh, first question. The second question is that S is maximum if all the event happens, and if and only if, in fact, all the events happen with equal uh, probability, namely that pi is 1 over n for all i. OK? So, this, so these are uh, simple algebraic exercises that uh, I ask you to try doing that. OK. Now, uh, one of the notions that happens, uh, uh, come up very often in the rest of the lecture is the notion of mutual information. So I would like to discuss that. So first, I'd like to introduce a notion of a conditional entropy. OK, so suppose we have, here I considered one set of event. So you do one experiment and to find out whether one of anything happens. So suppose you have two sets of events. So you have A1 to A n, B1 to B m. Suppose you have two sets of events happening, and then uh, they are not necessarily independent. So they can be correlated, for example. And uh, so there is a joint probability, which I denote P of A i B j. So that is a probability that event A i and BJ happens simultaneously. So then we have this conditional probability that uh, supposing that you know that AI happens, what is the probability that BJ happens? Well, that will be given by, so this is something you probably learned in uh, the high school, that uh, this should be given by this kind of ratio. And uh, similarly, This is given by this type of ratio. OK, so this leads to the definition of conditional entropy, which is the following. That suppose uh, you know that event AI happened. Suppose you know that event AI happens. What is the amount of information you gain by knowing that BJ happened? Well, that will be given by just substituting this into that formula there. So, so that means that uh, S of AI BJ is given by sum of over, over all J's AI BJ log of P of AI BJ. 
right? So namely that, uh, uh, so this is, a, this, is, this is a probability of BJ happening subject to, you already know that AI happened. So therefore, this is the amount of information you gain by knowing that BJ happened under that circumstance. But suppose you didn't know, you haven't done that ex uh, measurement to measure AI either, but you know that you are going to do the measurement. And then you want to find out how much uncertainty you have about BJ. That you can define by averaging this over all possible AIs. So, so that means that you sum over all AIs with this probability. And then you can, it's a simple algebra to show that this is given by minus sum of ij p of ai bj log of p of ai bj plus sum of i p ai log of p of ai. Okay? So, 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 so this is called conditional entropy. So this is conditional entropy. That is that entropy for doing uh, the discovery, uh, the entropy about information for BJs subject to the condition that you have already done the experiment, AI. Ah, excuse me. So, 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 so I, I actually put the wrong. So, 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 so this is the information. I, I, I apologize. So, so here I have already summed over J. So this is the amount of information uh, you gain about B when you already know that AI happened. This is the amount of information you gain about B after you, you, you are going, you, after you did this experiment AI, but you don't know the outcome of it yet. So that's why I, I average over AIs. Okay, so this leads me to define mutual information. Is there any question so far? Is this clear, what I'm talking about? So, so, so this leads me to this notion of mutual information. So this is the following notion that uh, suppose uh, uh, you want to know about B. What you want to know, what, what, is, what is this B? So for example, who is going to do, uh, win the election or something like that. But then uh, you, you are curious, well, I don't know what, it's very hard to know what B goes, what kind of B happens. But suppose I find out about A, how much can I learn about B? Okay, so the general uncertainty about B is just S of B. Yes. Let me see. Ah, okay, so you're saying that this can be B. Okay, I might have made a, a type. It's very hard for me to double check in real time, so can I correct it later? Okay. So, so, so this is an uncertainty I have about S of B. But now suppose uh, you, 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 you know you are going to measure A, and then you ask how much uncertainty you have about B. So that would be S of A of B. So, so that means that this is the amount of uncertainty you can reduce by doing the experiment A. Right? So namely, this is a measure of how useful it is to do the measurement A when you want to find out about B. So this is a mutual information. Interestingly, this mutual information is symmetric in A and B. That is that if I write this out, then I can express that in terms of uh, Shannon entropy. So important one of the important properties is symmetric. in A and B. Namely, so this mutual information tells you that how much you learn about B by learning about A, but it's mutual, that is that this is the same amount of information you, are, you learn about A 
if you measure B. Okay, so the information is mutual. Okay, so uh, so so far this has been rather abstract. So let me give you uh, some example to think about this concept. So suppose uh, you are going to school from your apartment, but then you forget when you woke up. Uh, where is my key? Where is, the, where is the key to the apartment? Okay. So you discover that uh, there is a 50% probability that it's in your pocket. Okay. But then there is uh, another 15% probability that it's in one of uh, 16 drawers uh, in your room. This happened to me very often. Actually, happening more often than I would like. Okay? So what is the uncertainty of the location of the key? Okay? So, so, so key location uncertainty. Well, so there is a one-half probability that uh, uh, it's in my pocket. So that's, that's this one. And then there are 16 possibility. There are 16 possibilities that it's one of the drawers. The probability that, uh, that is in each of the drawers, I assume that they happen in the equal probability, is uh, 32, 1 over 32. So it's 1 over 32. And just make the calculation easy, let's, let's compute a log with base 2. You know that different base just give you a different normalization of the entropy. So, so, so here I'm using base 2. So then this is 3. So when you wake up and then you are in this situation that you don't know where the key is, the uncertainty you have is three. Okay, so that's how, that's how you quantify your uncertainty. Now I'm going to uh, 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 present to you some paradox. The paradox is as follows. Suppose you actually check because you have to go out and then check your pocket first and then you discover that it's not in it. Okay, so, so what's, the, what's, what's your uncertainty now? So you check the pocket, and then you discover that it's not in my pocket. And then what is the uncertainty about the key location? Okay, so, so we can use this conditional entropy to evaluate this. So A is not in my pocket, and uh, key location, right? And uh, so if you evaluate it, so it's 16, now there are 16 possibility, 1 over 16 log 2 of 1 over 16, it's actually 4. So it's greater than 3. So why is it that you actually, so this means that you lost the information. You, you did something and you lost the information, so that doesn't seem to be fair. <laughs> Uncertainty has been increased by knowing that key is not in my pocket. So what's going on? Actually, this is not the correct calculation to do. The correct calculation is the conditional entropy that you obtain by checking your pocket, but you don't know your, the outcome. Okay, so, so check the pocket. Check my pocket. And then uncertainty of key location. So let's calculate that. Well, so we can use that formula so that probability is one half for, for so let me just uh, uh, mention the uh, calculation. So the pro there is a probability one half that uh, it's in my pocket. But if it is in my, in my pocket, now you know where the key is. So uncertainty is zero. And then there is a, uh, another probability that uh, uh, there is another half probability that it's not in my pocket, which is in that case, it's in one of these drawers. I have already calculated that to be four. So this is four. So that means that uh, the conditional entropy for the key location is two. Oh, good. So it's less than three. So this, this, this is what's going to happen to you in the morning as far as the key location uncertainty is concerned. So you wake up, 
And you don't know where your, your key is. The, uh, you, you figure that there is a 50% probability it's in your pocket. There is a 50% probability that it's one of the 16 drawers. Your uncertainty is three. Now you are going to decide that, well, let's first check my pocket because there is a 50% probability. You are going to do that because you know that the uncertainty will be reduced to two. So you, you did that. You, so that's why you do it, right? But then you discover that it's not in my pocket and you really get upset because uncertainty is now increased to four. Okay, so it it's actually agrees with your intuition about uh, what the uncertainty should be. Okay, so so far I considered classical information theory that I was dealing with information that are classical, that have already always uh, have fixed value. But of course I'm going to talk about, since I'm going to talk about quantum gravity, so I should talk about uh, quantum information. So that can be measured by von Neumann entropy. Okay, so suppose you have a Hilbert space. And uh, suppose you have an ensemble, which is a set of states. And I say that each one of these states happens with probability pi. So then, uh, uh, and then we are, we are, let's, let's take these to be also normal. So you have an ensemble of also normal states, uh, each happening with probability p. So, so this can be described in terms of density matrix. Like that. The von Neumann entropy uh, is defined, the von Neumann de entropy for this density of state is defined as log of uh, uh, a trace. Uh, uh, t t t so, excuse me, what am I writing? I just came to Japan last midnight, arrived here, so I have an excuse. Uh, it's trace of uh, 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 minus rho log rho, okay? Uh, actually, I just learned this morning that Nima Arukani Hamed gave uh, a lecture last week discussing uh, uh, inequality property, property of this uh, quantity, but uh, I briefly saw uh, the beginning part of the video, and uh, so what I'm going to do is actually give you explanation of why this is a good quantity to measure, okay? Uh, so, in particular, if you know that the row already have this basis like that, then it's easy to, to show that this is actually equal to sum over i pi log of pi. So, in this basis, so when you know that the uh, density matrix can be presented uh, in this uh, also normal basis, then it agrees with the uh, Shannon entropy. Now, uh, let me talk about, so here I talked about joint uh, probability and conditional entropy, et cetera. So we can repeat the uh, discussion quantumly. So we can consider a notion of joint entropy. Uh, which is to say that suppose we have a density matrix row of AB acting on the tensor product of two Hilbert spaces, HA and HB, then I can define the notion of joint entropy S of AB simply as minus trace of rho AB log of rho AB. Okay, so this would be a quantum analog of uh, this type of quantity here. So this is a, a joint entropy of A and B classically, and uh, this is a quantum counterpart of this. And uh, when, again, when rho can be also diagonalized in also normal basis, these two agrees, okay? 
Now, this uh, joint entropy has uh, various important inequalities. Uh, Nima, I saw, uh, gave a very nice, uh, in, uh, surprisingly creative proof of uh, 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 various inequalities. So I'm just going to state those things. So the one in, in, important uh, uh, notion is sub-additivity, which is to say that SA plus SB minus SAB is positive. But you see that this is actually nothing but the mutual information. So the mutual information being positive is uh, one of the property of the von Neumann entropy. And uh, so that's a good thing to know because that means that uh, when you do something, you always gain some information. You never lose information by measuring other things, right? Sometimes it's zero. When, when they are independent, two events are independent, the mutual information, of course, is zero. So that means that learning about B does not reduce the uncertainty for A, but when they are correlated, when you measure B, you always gain some information about A. That's what it means. That's what subadditivity means. Another useful inequality is the concavity of entropy. So the concavity is the following notion. That uh, uh, if I consider entropy for some linear combination of uh, density matrices, uh, can you actually distinguish my P and rho? Should I write them more distinguishably? Is this OK? Then uh, the concavity means that uh, it's actually uh, uh, always greater than or equal to this thing. You can take PI out. And then there is a, a, another side of the inequality, which says this, where this guy here is a classical Shannon entropy, which is minus log, uh, PI log PI. So uh, the concavity means that uh, this entropy for the linear combination superposition of uh, uh, density matrices is bounded below the, by this and bounded above by this. This also has uh, some nice interpretation. Uh, it actually is useful in many ways, but one place where it appears is the notion called the horrible information. So horrible information is defined in the following way. And uh, this shows up in many circumstances in, in information theory. So for example, suppose somebody send you some mixing, mixed state of this kind of density matrices, and you are supposed to do some measurement to figure out which one of these raw eyes was being sent. And whatever information give you an upper bound of your ability to figure out which one that was sent to you. And it actually have a very nice uh, interpretation in many circumstances, in, including holographically. And uh, I might be, if I have time, I would like to uh, discuss uh, those. But anyway, so the concavity in this case means that uh, the, the, this uh, horrible information is bounded both from below and above. OK? So those are two uh, uh, inequalities. And there is a third inequality that uh, uh, I'd like to also mention, which is a strong subadditivity. And I believe this is what Nima talked about uh, in his uh, lecture, 
which is S of A, B, plus S of B, C, is greater than S of B plus S of A, B, C. And uh, uh, this is slightly more difficult to prove. Uh, we'll discuss holographic proof of, of this inequality uh, uh, maybe tomorrow. But uh, for now, let me mention that if I use the notion of mutual information that I raised, oh, no, I have not. So, so if we use this mutual information, then I can actually write uh, this uh, uh, strong subjectivity in an equivalent form as S of A and I of A, mutual information between A and B, C, is greater than I of A, B. And uh, I leave this to your exercise to check this. This is a very simple algebraic. You just substitute the definition of this and then uh, check it. But, uh, but this, is a, this gives you a very natural information. What it means is that the, the more you learn, the less uncertainty we are, which is, which is, which is encapsulated in this inequality. The, so this is, this is the amount of information you know about A by knowing about B. This is the information you know about A by knowing B and C. So that means that more you learn about subjects that is not directly related to A, nevertheless, you learn more about A also. So this sounds like a, a, a profound life lesson, but uh, this is uh, stated in the form of uh, strong subadditivity. Okay, so now uh, let me come to the uh, main sort of concept of this set of lecture, which is an entanglement. And uh, one of the reasons that entropy is useful is that it gives you a way to quantify the amount of entanglement that the given state can have. Okay, so let me first uh, uh, start with uh, a very simple example. So suppose you have two Hilbert spaces, both two-dimensional. So suppose you have HA, which consists of two states, zero and one. And uh, another Hilbert space, which also consists of two states, zero and one. Okay, so then you consider a tensor product of these two Hilbert spaces, and you consider various state. So for example, you can consider a direct product state. This, such a state we consider, we regard as having no entanglement. On the other hand, uh, you, you, you can have a, a state which is sort of uh, deeply entangled. is of this form, for example. And this is actually a particular state that Einstein, Podovsky, and Rosen considered in their famous 1935 paper, uh, where they exhibited the uh, surprising property of uh, entangled state. The term entanglement itself was coined by Schrodinger, I understand, after their paper. But uh, for this reason, uh, let me call this as EPR state. So this is an entangled state, and this is a state which is not entangled. So I would like to use entropy to quantify the amount of entanglement. So let me define entanglement entropy. So suppose you have a state in a tensor product of a Hilbert space, and uh, you want to find out how much entanglement between A and B this particular state is causing. Okay, so for that, we first evaluate what is called partial trace uh, of this state, which is, uh, you start with this pure state density matrix, and you take trace over Hilbert space of B. 
Then you obtain some state which is acting on the Hilbert space of A, and then you compute the entanglement, sorry, for Neumann entropy for this density matrix in the Hilbert space, of course, of A. So this is a definition of entanglement entropy. So as an exercise, uh, let, let's evaluate this uh, for uh, these, these two states that I introduced. So uh, again, to simplify our calculation, let's do that with base two. So if I do that, and if, you, if I substitute this and this into this definition and the workout, which I encourage you to do by yourself, Sorry? Uh, yeah, I keep doing this. Maybe I should do the global replacement, or, but then, then this is going to be changed too, so that would be a problem. Thank you for, please point out any errors. I, I appreciate Mukunda and uh, uh, t telling us, um, uh, at Mukunda and Atish uh, are correcting, and I encourage you to correct, and maybe you, I'll give a prize for people who, correct my mistake. Anyway, so suppose I evaluate this for this pure state, which is just a tensor product. Then you can actually check that uh, this quantity is zero. Whereas uh, 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 if this is uh, EPR, then this is one. And in fact, uh, this is a maximum amount that you can have for this particular uh, 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 entanglement entropy. So, so in, in, that, in that sense, uh, uh, EPR pair is actually maximally entangled. In fact, in some sense, uh, entanglement entropy defined in this way is measuring how much EPR pair you have uh, between uh, these two Hilbert spaces. And uh, it is because you can actually prove the following theorem. I'm not going to prove it, but uh, uh, you can actually find that proof in the literature, which is the following. So suppose you uh, start with this state that I have. So suppose I pick any state in this tensor product. It can be any superposition of these two state in this Hilbert space. But then I consider n tensor product of this. Okay, so I compute n, or consider n copies of these Hilbert spaces, and then I consider n tensor product. And then what I'm, go I'm going to do, what uh, information theory is called uh, local operation and uh, classical communication. Uh, which is it's a long word, sometimes called L-O-C-C, uh, which is an operation which you are permitted to do unitary transformation on A only or B only separately, and, but you don't do any quantum operation mixing A and B. So for example, if you can do arbitrary unitary transformation, certainly there is a unitary transformation on this total Hilbert space, which maps this into here, right? You can, you can find such unitary transformation because both are normalized to be one. So, so you can do that. That would destroy your entanglement. That would change the amount of entanglement. But suppose I do unitary transformation on A side only. Suppose, for example, I just define this to be one and change this to be zero. The amount of entanglement is not changed. So if I do the unitary transformation on A side only, then it won't change the amount of information. So LOCC uh, is sort of a formalization of this kind of concept, the kind of operation you can do in this joint Hilbert space, which won't change the entanglement property of this state. But then you can show that if you consider any tensor product of this, it's actually always, you can always map that into tensor product of EPR pairs. And the amount of EPR pair you have is uh, given by the entanglement entropy times n. Where this symbol, this mathematical symbol just means that it's an integer part. In general, en en entanglement entropy is, is some real number. So uh, you multiply n 
and then you take real, uh, the integer part of it. Okay? So, so this is true asymptotically, so for large n. So for large n, asymptotically, this can be mapped into, so, so th this roughly is saying that uh, the entanglement entropy with base two is, so this, this, this two means that it's, I'm using log of base two, is roughly the amount of uh, EPR pair that this particular state can have. So, so this is sort of a useful uh, sort of intuitive way to think about uh, uh, entanglement entropy. Now, uh, I should say that, uh, so this was about pure state. And for mixed state, if you, can start, you can certainly start with a mixed state. So instead of this, you can also consider rho A to be a trace of HB of rho AB for more general mixed state. And then I, I, one can define the entanglement entropy for, for this one. So this actually not, is not symmetric in A and B. Yes? Suppose I put the minus here. So, so, so this, this is still one. So, so this one has the same entanglement entropy as the EPR pair. And so, 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 so well, in fact, uh, you can relate all this by LOCC. So, 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 I would, so one would consider this as having the same amount of EPR pair as this or, or this. They all have the same amount, same number of EPR pair, modulo LOCC. Okay? Now, coming back to the mixed state, so so far I talked about pure state, but for mixed state, uh, you can still consider entanglement entropy, but that quantity is actually not symmetric in A and B. So, may not be necessarily be a, a good measure for quantum correlation between A and B, because you would hope that notion of quantum correlation would be symmetric in A and B. So in that case, it's actually uh, maybe more useful to consider mutual information. And this has an added benefit that if you consider quantum field theory, which I'm going to do next, then uh, this quantity is actually ultraviolet finite. So it's, it's more well-defined uh, than the entanglement entropy itself. Okay, so any questions so far? So, so I reviewed the notion of Shannon entropy, I, and then I, I discussed the various inequalities. I introduced a notion of von Neumann entropy, which is a quantum counterpart of it, and discuss uh, various uh, inequalities. And they use the von Neumann entropy to introduce a notion of entanglement entropy as a measure of entanglement of uh, uh, state in the uh, tensor product of Hilbert space. And uh, explain that uh, uh, it's actually basically count the number of EPR pair in it. Okay? Any question? Okay. So uh, let me uh, present to you one uh, uh, particular example of how uh, entanglement entropy is calculated. So this is going to be an example that will be used uh, in the next lecture. So, uh, in the, so this is the primer of information theory, and the next lecture I will discuss, uh, I, I will cover some, some basic relevant aspects of ADS shift correspondence. So naturally, uh, we should consider entanglement entropy in the context of conformal field theory. And, uh, Entanglement entropy in conformal field theory in two dimensions has a very uh, nice expression uh, obtained by uh, Calabrese. 
And Cardi, in the beautiful paper in HEPTH 0405152. So let me, uh, in the remaining time, uh, let me review uh, the calculation. So it's a, a, a two-dimensional conformal field theory. So it's defined on the circle in the space-like section. And then you have a time. in this direction. And then you consider some particular state. Uh, I, I'm going to actually consider a vacuum state. And, uh, but I'm interested in entanglement between different spatial points uh, of this uh, conformal field theory. So what I'm going to do is to separate this space right part into two parts. So you have this segment A and its complement A bar. OK? So uh, we have quantum field theory, so that means that we have some kind of local degrees of freedom uh, on this space-like section distributed. So intuitively, you would think that the total Hilbert space uh, is decomposed into tensor product of the Hilbert space associated to the degrees of freedom on the subregion A and its complement. It's not quite precise because uh, uh, you have to actually specify how you re regularize uh, when you cut the Hilbert space into two parts. Uh, one way to think about it is that you first consider a lattice uh, uh, model where you discretize space and you put some degrees of freedom on each lattice. There, it's quite clear how you separate things. Of course, even in the case of lattice, there is a subtlety. If you have a gauge theory, the degrees of freedom is not, are not on the lattice point, but in the link. So then there is an issue of how to separate. So you have to specify the boundary condition here. But in fact, uh, uh, in no, all known example, uh, there is a way to separate uh, the Hilbert space into two parts if you add some degrees of freedom in the ultraviolet. But the, uh, the result is that it would, the, the way that you separate it would depend on how you do this. So namely that there is some kind of uh, 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 ambiguity or uh, some uh, freedom to choose uh, in introducing some ultraviolet degrees of freedom in order to do the separation. Okay. So that would change the amount of uh, entanglement entropy by some amount which is additive. So for example, if you consider mutual information like this, then that uncertainty is actually canceled. So that's another reason why mutual information is sort of a more well-defined quantity than the entanglement entropy itself. And uh, this has been discussed uh, in recent, uh, various recent literature. For example, in a particular case of two-dimensional conformal field series, there is an actually interesting paper by Tachikawa and Omori. Uh, and uh, with, this is a number. So if you are actually interested in, in this type of uh, issues, then this might be one of the places to start. And then there are also uh, uh, some literature on how you do it in lattice gauge theory. They discussed that in the context of uh, actually CFT2 that I'm going to talk about, and parameterize how much uncertainty you have uh, when you try to separate the Hilbert space into two. So anyway, so let me assume that you can do this separation. And then uh, start with the vacuum state of a, a conformal field theory and define the density matrix by taking trace of a complement A bar uh, of uh, this space. And, uh, and then calculate the uh, entanglement entropy. The procedure that was employed by uh, Calabrese and Cardi is first start with evaluating a, a, a quantity called the Rennie entropy. Which is defined as Sn of A, which is uh, one minus N log. So I'm going to from now on take the base to be E, the and then trace of rho HA 
to the end. And uh, you can uh, 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 easily see that uh, uh, if I take the limit of n goes to 1 of this uh, Rennie entropy, then this gives you the desired uh, entanglement entropy that uh, you want to evaluate. Uh, rho uh, density matrix is, of course, a positive definite operator. So you can take uh, a logarithm of this. And uh, this is sometimes called modular Hamiltonian. So knowing uh, Rennie entropy uh, is uh, quite closely related to understanding the spectrum of this modular Hamiltonian. Now, this quantity uh, can be calculated uh, in conformal field theory because this is related to computation of a correlation function, in fact, of uh, operators that generate a branch cut on the wall sheet. Uh, the reason is the following. So, so here, so pictorically, what we are doing is that we have the space-like section here, and we separate the space into A bar, A, and its complement. And we are taking trace in order to define, in order to define rho A, what we are doing is taking a trace of a complement of the vacuum state. So we have this vacuum state coming here, coming here. I'm taking trace over here, but I keep this thing open. So you have an in state on this side and out state over here. That is this. So you have in state here, out state here, which is in state here, out state here. Now, this quantity is obtained by taking n trace, uh, n product of this. So that means that this is now glued to here, and then glued here, glued here, etc. You do this n times. That's the Rennie entropy. So if you have a vacuum state here and here, this can be evaluated with a sphere passion function on the sphere with cut over A. And if I take n product of this thing, what you are doing is group, taking product of this n times. So that means that you are taking n spheres and then cutting, make, introducing, uh, adding n slices over A and then gluing them together. So this is the same as doing, introducing branch cuts here where it's n, fold, it's n fold branch cut. If you go over n times, you come back to the same sphere. OK? So such quantity can be defined in quantum, uh, conformal field theory. And then basically, this amounts to calculating the correlation function of this operator, where uh, you, the, I, I, I call this point u and v. So the distance between them is u and v. And uh, so I actually only have five more minutes, so I don't have time to discuss more detail. But this quantity can be evaluated very easily by knowing how energy momentum tensor of this conformal field theory transforms under coordinate transformation. Suppose I do the coordinate transformation in two dimensions from z to w. Then it is known that the energy momentum tensor of conformal field theory transforms like this. Where this is a Schwarzian derivative.
And uh, uh, using that, uh, we can actually evaluate this quantity, this correlation function, as uh, u minus v to 1 over 6 times uh, n minus 1 over n, where u and v are location of these branch cuts. And then uh, from this, you can actually calculate this uh, Rennie entropy. And then if you take the limit, so, so this amounts to, so, so I'm sorry. So th this, this, this is actually this part. And then if I take log and multiply one over, uh, 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 one, over one minus n, then the Rennie entropy is obtained as c over six, one plus uh, one over n times log of distance, so let's call this uh, uh, length of this to be small l. So this is small l. Then you have log l plus some constant. And this constant is related to the ambiguity that you have in separating the Hilbert space into two parts, the one associated to A and the one associated to A bar. You can see that uh, there is actually uh, such, uh, there should be such ambiguity because uh, uh, L is actually dimensionful quantity. On the other hand, we are co considering conformal field series, so, so the quantity that you can actually evaluate should be dimensionless. And in particular, it's funny to have a dimensionful quantity in log because if you change the scale, you would you'd change the value of log by shifting some constant, and that is absorbed into this constant part. So from this, you can also see that uh, somehow this constant part has to be related to the uh, way that you regularize and separate the Hilbert space into two. So at any rate, so from this, you can actually show by taking the limit of n equal one that this is given by one third of log of L plus constant. So, so actually, uh, this formula is true uh, when the, the size of L is much smaller than circumference, the, the, the radius, uh, the circumference of the entire sphere, entire circle. And uh, the more precise formula when the uh, uh, circumference of S1 is L, is given by L sine high small L over capital L plus constant. Okay, so I had to uh, 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 run a little bit quickly uh, to do the uh, calculation. If you want to know more detail, I encourage you to consult the original uh, paper where this is actually explained uh, very clearly and nicely. And, uh, but I just wanted to give you an appetite for uh, getting into this uh, reference. And uh, also, uh, I'm going to use this formula in the next lecture, so I wanted to have something to refer to. Okay, so, so today, basically, I cover the concept of entropy uh, in information theory and introduced various uh, inequality for both classical Shannon entropy and quantum von Neumann entropy, and explain that the entanglement entropy defined in this way count the amount of EPR pairs and then discuss uh, how you can actually evaluate this quantity in the case of conformal history. Okay, any question here? Yes, please. Uh, you said the LOCC doesn't change the entanglement entropy, and the, uh, on the first, uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the, it's a product state, so the entanglement entropy should be zero. And how could the right-hand side should be zero? Oh, since well, there, there is a, so, so this state belongs to tensor product of uh, this Hilbert space and uh, this Hilbert space. It is true that it's a, uh, it's a product state for this Hilbert space. But there is an entanglement between here and here. So, so this, well, it depends on what you mean by product state. So namely, so for, suppose for example, 
so suppose you have a pr product state of HA and HB, but HA itself may be a product, tens tensor product state, and there can be entanglement within it, right? So when you say it's entanglement, you have to tell me entanglement between what? So this is a tensor product, so that means that it doesn't have entanglement between different components of this product. Namely, HA times HB, so there are n copies of this, right? There are no entanglement between different copies because it's a product state. But there is an entanglement inside of each copy. So the whole state, so if you, so there are two n components in it, right? There are two n Hilbert space in it. There is an entanglement in some part of that Hilbert space. Okay? But, but of course, it's a product state for this, so, so there are no entanglement between the copies. Any other question? Down there. Uh, just trying to understand your construction of uh, taking the sphere, slitting it along the interval A, and joining uh, n copies right. of that together. Is the resulting thing an n-fold cover of the sphere branched at the two points, UV? Yes. That's ex okay. That's what it is. Yes. So if you think this through, you are considering. So so you know that uh, if you consider a passion of if you consider the vacuum amplitude with some ob object, it's the same as a sphere with that operator inserted. And what I'm doing here is uh, taking, so there is this uh, uh, subset, subregion A, and then I'm taking trace on the complement. But I'm not taking trace over A, so that means that I'm opening up this so that you can have state coming in and coming out. And then I'm gluing this together here. And I think on the covering, the log becomes a so single. So this is u and v, by the way. Yes? On the covering, the log becomes a single valued function? Is that a, Yes, so, so, so in n for the cover, it's a single valued thing. So you, what you are doing, supposed to do is to consider functional integral of this conformal field theory on the n for the covering of the sphere and uh, compare that with the partition function of the end product of sphere, and uh, that is this quantity. Thank you. And uh, that is actually uh, shown very carefully in this paper. So if you want to know the detail, this is a good reference to look at. Okay? Yes. Can you be a bit more explicit about the assumptions that go into being able to separate the Hilbert spaces on spatial slices? When you separate your space in A and A bar, what are the assumptions that go into being able to also separate the total Hilbert space? So, so let me try to understand you. So, so you're talking about this separation of the Hilbert space? Yes. What is your question? What are the assumptions that go into being able to separate the Hilbert space? A would, sorry? There are assumptions going into being able to separate the Hilbert space in H A and H A bar, right? This is not true in general. Ah, uh, you're asking under what assumption? So, so if you can have actually depends on the kind of UB regularization you can have. For example, if you can define conformal field theory as uh, infrared limit of some uh, lattice model with uh, degrees of freedom residing on each lattice point, then you can separate the Hilbert space. But for example, uh, there can be a case when you have degrees of freedom on the link, then in that case you have to actually have prescription of how to separate the link. What they did in this particular paper, for example, is use open string field theory to define separation of conformal field theory. Because uh, if you have open string field theory, then, then you can have a vertex operator which turns closed string into open string, in a way that preserves conformal invariance. So, so you can have a closed string coming in, and then you can have open string coming out like that. So this will be separating the Hilbert space or entire Hilbert space into A and its complement, right? So, 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 so in fact, you need two open string vertex operators here and on the other side. But what happens if you do that is that you have to specify the, uh, the d boundary conditions. You have, a, you have open string, so you have a boundary condition here. 
So you have D brain, you have to put D brains on it. Now, you don't necessarily have a unique choice of D brain. In many conformal field theory, you can have different D brains. So you can have a D brain uh, called denoted by alpha, and you can you have a D brain denoted by beta on the other side. That's one of these ambiguities. And what these people showed was actually this ambiguity can be traced back to the ambiguity in separating the lattice, mo lattice model into parts using this. So there is actually natural ma nice na matchup in that case that they, they, they studied of how the ambiguity in separating the Hilbert space in the U U UB definition of the theory in the lattice model is reflected on the ultraviolet def description in terms of conformal field theory, okay? Okay, if there are no other questions, we can uh, probably thank Hiroshi, yes.